Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to Gary Alexander, the moderator for this session. Thank you, and it's uh, great to be here with you. Uh, the topic of this uh, panel is, is certainly one that resonates with the theme of speaking truth to policy. Uh, I think I know why I'm here. Uh, Kansas just completed a year's worth of study f of our developmental policies. We convened a task force that consisted of all of our two years, including our technical colleges, our universities. Uh, we did not have a direct representative of our, de of our Department of Education, but we're working on rectifying that situation. And we got a little bit of press. We put out a report. Now, the question for us, and the problem in a way, as I stand here, is we haven't done anything. Other than to say, and we are, uh, we, we did an inventory of our uh, remedial work and what's going on on the campuses, and we reflected on the, uh, what is the, the tenor of what we're doing here today. We all are beginning with a negative. Uh, we, I knew, and we, we started with the, the uh, we agree with the claim that's on the uh, description of this, uh, this session. Those of us working in higher education have known for years that developmental education policies and programs were not improving student completion or success. So we started with that uh, assumption. At the same time, we wanted to try to save the egos of our people who are working. We have to think about the teachers who are involved in this process. And one of the things that struck me as I stood in front of my board delivering a report that had been accomplished by my staff and, and experts across the system was that to remind myself and to remind the board that we are fundamentally teachers that, as we've said many times here today, are in this, set, this uh, meeting, uh, students are the goal, are our, are our goal. It's students are uh, what we're here for. I spent 20 years in a classroom teaching students. This is simply, to me at any rate, teaching a different sector of students. They're not some special group that lies outside of the mainstream of the human condition. They are people who want to learn, who want to succeed at what they do. So with that in mind, uh, we gathered a panel, and I think it's time that I introduce the panel of experts and turn them over to, uh, turn them over to you or you over to them and let them tell you what they're up to. Uh, we have Dr. Suzanne, Suzanne morales Vale who is Director of uh, Developmental Education and Adult Basic Education with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And we did some creative seating, uh, I should say, because uh, they wanted to be sure that when they changed their PowerPoints, they would actually get changed. If that were left to me, I am famed for hitting the wrong button. So. I'm hiding down on the other end. So we have Dr. Morales Vale, uh, who will speak first. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Tamara White, uh, Dean of Students at the Community College of Aurora, Colorado. And uh, then Monica Chan, Dr. Chan, Director of Policy and Research with the New England Board of Higher Education. So I, I'm here, I know why I'm here, other than I think why I'm here, because I need to learn and have a lot to learn and will learn a lot from this group. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, one thing I want to say that I really love what you just said, and that is students are at the heart of everything we do. And so when I look here, um, you know, I've got the word student here, and I too spent about 18 years in the classroom. And so I do come from that perspective as well. Um, when we talk about what's been going on in the state of Texas, it just worked a minute ago. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Okay. Um, we began, everything begins, of course, with a vision. And um, we re recently, our board has approved a developmental ed plan for the state of Texas. And you can see here our vision statement. And again, very happy to say we have the word students uh, throughout this. And, and you can see it's all about students. And what we are focusing on is what Under Secretary Mitchell also talked about, how to do things differently. And the main goal here is to move from traditional ways of uh, providing interventions to underprepared students to a non-traditional. If we look here, we can see that we've really built a framework. We've been, our work has been going on since 2003, if I can direct your eyes to the bottom of the slide. Um, of course, we had uh, the framework for the Texas Success Initiative 
And then we had the college and career readiness standards, uh, the Texas college and career readiness standards, which were approved. The work began in 2008, were approved in 2010. The set of standards, one set of standards and use of one assessment, um, that happened in 2011. And now, since this past fall, we have launched a new assessment. So as part of this uh, framework, we also, of course, have an important component, and that is the P16 pipeline. And you can see here some of the work that has uh, happened to help uh, engage in that pipeline and to help uh, further that pi pipeline. At the bottom here, what I've got is the most recent changes, and that is as a result of our last legislative session, and our high school graduation ha requirements have changed, and we also now have an opportunity for students to earn an exemption uh, uh, with the successful completion of a high school co uh, prep course um, for the students who haven't yet demonstrated college readiness by the time they're at the end of their junior, senior year. So this is new. So this is uh, going to be effective this fall. So we are going to uh, eagerly await some of the changes as a result and hopefully some of the progress. So our Texas Success Initiative, much like what goes on in your states as well, um, each undergraduate student has to demonstrate college readiness. And they can do that in a number of ways. And in fact, about uh, more than half of our students don't even take this assessment for college readiness because they have uh, qualified for one or more of these exemptions. Um, in red there, I have got the STAR end of course. Those are our high school graduation tests. And as a result of House Bill 5, those are temporarily not available. And so students are trying to find other ways to demonstrate college readiness. But as you can see here is a typical outline of exemptions that I'm sure many other states also have available. So we have our new assessment. The, the work was completed and the assessment launched in fall. It is aligned to our college and career readiness standards, and it includes a diagnostic component for students who don't meet the college readiness standard. It also aligns to the national standards for adult education. It is completely delivered online. It is computer adaptive, provides a diagnostic profile, and provides a reasonable cost. The assessment itself, and comparing the old assessment system, we had four assessment instruments. You may be familiar with a lot of them, the Accuplacer, Thea, Compass, and Asset, that were allowed. Um, institutions could choose, and many institutions chose more than one. We also um, had state minimal standards for college readiness, but institutions were allowed to raise those standards. And basically, there were two classifications. Students either met the standards and were college ready, or they were not. Now, with this new system, we have one instrument that is um, approved statewide, and we call it the TSI assessment, very uh, unique and innovative there. Um, we also have one statewide standard for college readiness that institutions cannot raise. And so this, I think, has helped a lot with um, our, our uh, interaction with the K-12 world, especially students who are trying to do all the right things to prepare, that um, those standards are same across the state and not contingent upon which institution they would like to attend. Uh, and now, instead of just two classifications of being either college ready or not, we have further defined the college, the non-college ready um, population and divided it into secondary, which we uh, call you know, developmental education. So that's roughly equivalent to the ninth through 12th grade skill, knowledge and skill levels, and then those below the secondary or below the high school levels, and those are adult basic education. Other changes um, that happened uh, in our rules, we now require a pre-assessment activity, and if it, Quick way to say this, students are no longer take, allowed to take the test cold turkey. They have to be engaged in some sort of activity. Um, the purpose of this was to give some minimal per parameters, but to allow enough um, leeway and, allow, and enough uh, flexibility so that institutions can look at their current intake processes and see where this would fit in, this, this activity. Also, very important, and that is holistic advising. And this is the, the use of multiple factors for placement considerations. Not only, of course, the results of the assessment and the diagnostic profile, but also a number of other factors. And these are um, institutional, uh, de institutionally decided. And um, we have a little bit of an idea here. And I apologize for the minuscule 
font here, the, the minor, the tiny font, but this is based on the most recent annual survey we do for um, our developmental education programs across the state. And you can see that um, this requirement has been placed for only a year, but over 85% of our, our institutions are considering more factors other than just one um, test result. Um, including academic coursework, that's the 85.3%. Non-cognitive factors, so those are, uh, an example would be an assessment like the LASI, which measures motivation, self-efficacy, um, family life issues, considerations for those, and of course the high school GPA. So you can see that um, a number of factors are being considered. Uh, the way our assessment process works, again, as I mentioned, we require pre-assessment activity. Then the students engage in a placement component, which is approximately 20 questions per subject area. If they meet the college readiness threshold at that point, they're, they're complete, and they can en enroll in any entry-level college credit course. If they aren't, then they're directed into one of two diagnostics, depending on where they did uh, the range of where they tested. Um, and you can see here at the bottom uh, where it says ABE diagnostic, even then, even though students are directed into that diagnostic, they still have a second chance opportunity, if you will, to test back into a higher level and to demonstrate a, a higher level of knowledge and skills. The yellow box we intentionally made yellow because this is new. This is the first time institutions are asked to formally identify this group of students. And while we do have, of course, great alignment programs with our federally funded adult education and literacy programs, but at institutions of higher ed, this is the first time they have formally identified this group. So, of course, we have our course manual, which includes a description of all the uh, courses eligible for funding. And we have outcomes defined for each course, and along with the course description, we do have funding limits, and we do say our assessment cannot be used for admissions purposes. So those are two separate things. And something that has been really intriguing and in interesting is students are allowed to retest at any time. And so that does um, provide a lot of um, opportunity for uh, conversation. Our acceleration models that we are promoting, um, the co-requisite models, the mainstreaming models, um, where a student co-enrolls in a credit bearing and some sort of developmental education support. And the key here is the developmental education support is not a traditional developmental ed course. It is some sort of non-course based option uh, depending on the demonstrated weak areas of the student that provides additional support, just-in-time support with the main goal of ensuring, helping to ensure success of the student in the credit bearing course. Of course, we've also been working with the uh, differentiated math pathway models. We know one of the biggest obstacles for student success, persistence, and completion is the math requirement for many students. And so if the level of remediation and the type of remediation um, is informed by the type of math that the student needs to complete in his or her degree plan, uh, the, the research suggests that that will definitely help with the success and completions for students. The non-course competency-based options. This has been the most flexible option, and it is pretty much based on ranges of faculty content expert estimated time that a student would need to address his or her demonstrated weak areas. And so this offers a lot of flexibility. These are available for funding, for uh, funding formula, formula funding reimbursement to institutions. We also have asked institutions to integrate their upper level reading and writing courses and there are a number of other mod modular and other models such as compressed courses. In terms of the non-course competency based options, you can see that almost 100% of our institutions are providing this option in math. And of course, as we know, that for many students is the biggest obstacle. So we are very glad to see that institutions are responding to this opportunity for their students. Of course, we know our reform process. We focus on research studies, not only in statewide, but of course national. We highlight statewide data, and this I'm gonna show you in a, a slide in a second that's been really um, the most impactful, I believe. Uh, of course, whenever we can, and this is based on the appropriations provided by our legislature, and is to fund competitive grants that focus on scaling and sustaining, especially when the monies go away for the institution and the grant uh, period ends. And of course, always independently evaluate the outcomes. 
So this is the slide that has been really the most impactful. When we go across the state and we talk to our institutions and we talk to faculty, as mentioned in the previous session, faculty really are at the heart of this. And I totally agree with one of the panelists who said that most faculty are ready to see and want to see their students succeed. And when we show them this information here, so we have 100 students who showed up at the doorstep at the institution, went through the trouble, all of the uh, you know enrollment, registration procedures, uh, um, and then showed up and took the test. Uh, of the 100 who were told they were not college ready, and you can see it's divided by subject area, how many actually come back after they told they were not college ready in one or more area and enroll in their first developmental education course? And you can see that is a huge difference there, and that is one of the biggest focus areas for our institutions to begin to address. Then, once they do enroll, how many actually achieve college readiness? Now, this can be done through successful completion of the credit bearing, excuse me, of the developmental ed course or intervention, or also some sort of retesting. Um, and then how many successfully complete the first college level course? And as I said, the biggest challenge is in math, and you can see here the numbers surely um, confirm that. So some uh, advice, lessons learned. Uh, we have moved to an outcomes-based funding model for our community colleges, and uh, we think that may be a big game changer because it is the biggest topic of conversation and the biggest area of questions for institutions. So we know this has gotten everyone's attention. Of course, and, and you know, I'm really preaching to the choir here, right? Get buy-in. Um, marketing, marketing your ideas, allowing for feedback and comments and be open to revisions um, is, is hugely important. Be transparent with outcomes. Well, we heard earlier in the previous session that transparency is important. Phase in whenever we know all of this work has to be, should have been completed yesterday, but we also have to acknowledge that it does take time for institutions to change. We don't just want change, but we want informed, effective change. Um, professional development is key, and we have been fortunate enough that the legislature has funded statewide professional development opportunities and comprehensive programs. Um, and then if, if depending on how uh, you know, your state has organized its higher education system, institutional flexibility allowing for that and diversity is also very important. So we have all of our information here on our website. I invite you to explore our website. And, of course, here we have uh, my other partners in crime in our division. And I guess at this point we'll go ahead and move on to the next, Monica, the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, once again, my name is Tamara White. And I'm on this panel because I previously worked for the Colorado Department of Higher Education. Um, and in my role there, um, it was actually a new position that was created to revise the remedial education policy and the admission standards policy. And in that role, I also was able to sit on the um, Colorado Community College System Developmental Education Redesign. Um, and I also sat on the Graduation Guidelines Development Council um, for the state. So I had a wonderful opportunity to help with a lot of P20 alignment for the state. And so I believe that that's why, one of the reasons um, that I was asked to sit on the panel. Um, but I have since moved on to a new position, and I work at the Community College of Aurora now. So uh, I have been thinking what is going to be most helpful for you all to hear in terms of the work that I've done in the past couple of years. And so I thought giving you just a brief history of some of the policy work that's happened in Colorado and talking about this past uh, two years and all of the, there's been a lot of development in P20 alignment, and it has a lot to do with um, developmental education here in Colorado. And so I thought I would talk about the current landscape and then just briefly talk about um, the future in Colorado. And in the current landscape, talk about the remedial education uh, policy, supplemental academic instruction, which is co-requisite remedial education here in Colorado. I'll talk about the Colorado Community College System Developmental Education Redesign, 
And here in Colorado, the Colorado Community College system houses 13 community colleges around the state. And then we have two other local district community colleges, and those are the uh, community colleges in the state. And that's where a lot of our, most of our developmental education is, is given in the state. Um, and then I was just going to touch on the admission standards and graduation guidelines, and because that goes with a lot of the alignment. So here's some history of policy in Colorado, and CCHE is the Colorado Commission on Higher Education. And in 1986, we revised uh, the, de the commission's role in admission. Um, in 2001, we developed a statewide remedial policy, which stated that institutions, all public institutions in, in the state, had to have the same college-ready cut score. And I'll show that to you in a minute. Um, in 2003, we actually revised the admission standards policy. Uh, 2008 was, is the biggest deal, and that's really why this slide is up here, is we created legislation called the Colorado Achievement Plan for Kids, which is cap for k And in that legislation, we talked a lot about how we could align the preschool, K-12, higher ed, so that our students were ready um, for whatever it was they decided to do with their lives. And in that legislation, we talked about aligning graduation guidelines, uh, remedial education, um, admission standards. Um, so that was really groundbreaking, groundbreaking for Colorado, and that really set up the stage for a lot of the work that happened over these past two years. And then in 2012, we passed um, the co-requisite remedial education policy um, for the state. So I think it's important to understand that the commission um, does have statutory, um, not, the, not guidance, but they have um, permission um, to do admission standards for the state for first-time admission and transfer students. They also have to monitor um, remedial education skills for students coming into colleges for math and English. Um, we also are statutorily required to work with K-12 in a post-secondary and workforce-ready uh, de uh, definition, and that's what we're calling career and college-ready. So we are statutorily required to do those things. So over the past two years, uh, we've had a lot of task forces, and I think that what is different about some of the policy development that's been happening is we've really gone to the practitioners and faculty to say what's working, what's not working. Let's look at um, let's look at the data. Let's look at other states. Let's look at best practices. Um, I don't know how many times we've had um, Complete College America come in, and let's really talk about what's working and how we can help our students to be more successful. And so. <clears throat> All of these um, areas had task forces happening. And so I want to talk about the DevEd redesign the fir first because they were the first to start. So the Colorado Community College system, they gathered a group of faculty from all 13 community colleges. They also gathered faculty from the local district community colleges. They gathered a few faculty from our four-year public institutions, and they decided to scrap the current um, <clears throat> the current way that they were implementing remedial education. And the current way they were doing it was a sequence, that we had an 030 for math and English that was kind of elementary level, we had an 060 that was kind of middle school level, and then we had an 090 that was high school level. And so students, um, depending on what they scored on the assessment, they were placed into those areas, and it could take them up to two years to actually get into a college level course. And what we found when we looked at the statistics was students who entered in at an 030 level, there was only a 4% chance that they would actually get to a college level course. Not get through it, but get to it. And so the community college system decided to just scrap that. Let's just start over. Let's see what's happening all around the country. And let's, um, they did different trials um, and all the different community colleges tried different things for a year. And then that was due to a, a Complete College America grant. And then at the end of the year, they looked at the data. And what they decided to do 
was one is they decided let's get students through remedial education in one semester, two at the most, um, and let's prepare them to be successful in the next course that they're getting into. Uh, we they thought well you know we're trying to prepare them for everything. That's why we keep creating 045 and 099. So how about we just prepare them for the next course? And so they took their recommendations to the um, the board and they were approved in February 2012. And actually in fall of 2014, all community college um, all community colleges that are in the system have to be implementing their new redesign. Um, and here are some of the, the redesigns that they did. They talked about a math pathway. They talked about how not all students should have to go through college algebra. Um, they, we should have a math for liberal arts. We should have a non-algebra math sequence. And then they also talked a lot about co-requisite remedial education for English. And so that is, um, and also contextualizing English. So, and I can talk more specifically if that's what you're interested in. But um, they did some really great work in combining things that were already working around the nation to come up with a system that would really work for our community colleges. Um, the next policy development task forces that were going on was for remedial education policy, which I said is where we set the cut scores for the state um, to say if a student scores below these scores, then they need to go into remedial education. Um, and then we also had a policy development group working on our admission standards policy, which is what institutions use to decide how to admit students into their institutions. And I think um, this slide is here just to let you know that we did have quite a process for that. We had a task force that was made up of practitioners in each of the areas, and we had two different task forces happening for these. And they examined a lot of best practices and a lot of data to see what was working and what wasn't working. They created some initial policy development, then we vetted it across the state, and then we brought the feedback back to the task force, and the task force created additional recommendations, and then that went to the commission in December. December, last December and was approved. Um, so this is the remedial education policy, the old one, so right before we got it approved. And these were the cut scores. And so what it said was a student needs to score a minimum 19 in uh, ACT in order to be placed into a college level course. If they score below that, then they need to be placed into a remedial course. And what we found um, is we actually did a study, a course level um, data study to see if our cut scores were still appropriate in terms of determining success for our students. And we found that they were. Um, and the other piece that's exciting is we aligned these scores with the new graduation guidelines. Um, so we were the 49th state, I think, to not have graduation guidelines for the whole state. So we have 176 school districts and they all had their own guidelines. Um, but we have created guidelines that say each um, district needs to meet at least these minimum requirements, and those minimum requirements meet these scores. So we're very excited about that piece. Um, and the other thing that happened with the re, um, review of the remedial policy is we decided that having just a cut score was a bit challenging for students because who's to say that a student didn't come in and they had a bad day and they took the assessment and because their kid was crying all the way there that they scored one point below the cut score. And so we put a lot more flexibility into the program because of the legislation that passed for co-requisite remedial education. And so this has allowed institutions to have more flexibility in terms of placement. And so this is what we're calling supplemental academic instruction, uh, but really truly what it is, is it's a co-requisite course um, that is attached to a college level math and English course um, where students who would have been placed or could have been placed into remedial education are placed into a college level course with this course attached and um, we're looking for more uh, success for students. And I can talk more about that. So this is the supplemental academic instruction policy. Again, it was created so that we can have institutions could have more flexibility in placing students. Um, it also has some financial implications. So previously, some institutions um, that were not statutorily allowed to put on remedial education were not um, allowed to have funding. And with the supplemental academic instruction piece, they are now able to have funding for the co-requisite courses that they attach to the college level courses. And um, before I left the, the state, um, there was Metropolitan State 
Colorado Community College System, Western, and Ames that had been approved to offer supplemental academic instruction. So Ian would be able to tell us if there were um, additional ones since then. And then the last piece I want to talk about for policy is the admission standards. And we do have a new admission standards policy coming through. Um, it will actually be in place fall of 2019. And the piece that's important with this is that prior to this, students could be admitted um, and still be in need of remedial education. But we put in a caveat into the new policy to say that the minimum admission standards for institutions is that students meet the college-ready cut scores, um, unless the institution has the support systems to be able to support the student to success. Um, and I think that that piece is important because, again, we're trying to have alignment. Um, make sure I got through all of my notes. Um, the last piece is just the future. Um, it's important that we are still working on cap for k uh, legislation. We still have some things to make sure happen because of that statute. Um, graduation guidelines alignment, common core state standards. We're working to make sure that our um, entry level, some of our entry level math and English courses are aligned with common core state standards. Uh, we're working to make sure that the admission standards are aligned with the graduation guidelines. Um, and then we're also working to talk about how do we use competency demonstration in the admission standards rather than seat time. So those are some of the future. Oh, I did want to add this. Um, if you have specific questions about the community college redesign, Casey Sachs is the one who coordinated that whole process. Um, and then these other folks are, are currently helping her with the implementation. Um, but Casey did a wonderful job with coordinating those efforts. And then I also have um, links to the Department of Higher Education's website if you want additional information. Um, for the task forces, for the admission standards and the remedial, we have all of our meeting notes and all of the data and presentations that we have, you can find on their website. We also have a really great um, visual for P20 alignment in Colorado, and it kind of gives you an idea of, from start to finish, a timeline. And then lastly, the DevEd Redesign, they also have a really wonderful uh, website that takes you through the whole task force and all the work and all the um, data that they saw to get to the decisions that they made. So those are the resources. Thank you. Well, sorry, everyone, for the delay on that. So thanks, Gary, for the introduction, and thanks to George and Julie and the SHIO team for the opportunity to be part of a really great meeting. I'm really excited to be up here. I think almost two New Englands could fit in Colorado, and I think probably four in Texas. Um, so it's, it's really great to be on, on a panel with um, Tamara and Suzanne. So thanks. Anyway, so I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'm, I'm going to talk relatively quickly. Feel free to stop me at any time. Um, I, I know sometimes I can speak pretty fast. But so in, in any case, as some background, I've prepared some slides in terms of the perspective that I'm bringing here from New England and how we're trying to support regional innovation across the New England states. Cool. So as background, some of you may be familiar that the New England Board of Higher Education, or NEBI for short, is one of four regional compacts. So we're sister organizations to MEC, SREB, and WICHE. Um, when I was in a Jersey girl, I learn the hard way that New Jersey is not part of New England. Um, so now as a New Englander, I'm, I'm glad I get to say that I, I serve the six New England states, which are Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont, and Connecticut. I'm not sure if I said Connecticut. Um, but as, as you can see, in, within this region, we have a large number of institutions, and, and it's pretty diverse. So each of the colored dots represent an institution. Each color is a different type of institution based on the Carnegie classification. Within this small region, though, we've seen quite a bit in terms of trends and movement in developmental education, and, and some of those are very similar to what's been shared here with what's been going on with Colorado and in Texas. So we've seen a lot of shift in terms of looking at placement policy and trying to change those, a shift towards multiple measures. Some of you are probably familiar with the 2012 legislation in Connecticut, which mandated that public institutions use multiple measures in order to place students in college level or developmental coursework. The Massachusetts Board of Higher Education will be piloting this fall um, the use 
use of GPA in college placement, and Vermont has recently implemented a self-directed assessment policy where students have a say in whether or not they're entering into or passing out of developmental coursework. So those are just some really quick snapshots in terms of what's happening around placement policy. We've also seen similar changes to sort of course sequencing and setup. Um, there's definitely been interest in sort of co-requisite embedded models. We've also seen shifts in institutions towards more modularized self-paced courses, um, as well as very sort of intensive summer boot camps or brush-up courses, if you will. Um, and I would say overlaying all of this, and some of you may remember a couple years ago when MOOCs came on the market, um, we got a lot of questions and sort of, well, what's the potential of open educational resources in sort of shifting the cost for students? So lowering the cost um, for developmental education, as well as potentially helping to support students learn on their own and, and on their own time. And it was within this context that um, we thought it would be really great to sort of support regional innovation and think more about that. And so we've called this effort the Developmental Math Demonstration Project, or DMDP for short. And with support from the Lumina Foundation, um, we've been able to format this project as sort of a three-year project, if you will, where we've partnered with community colleges and community college systems across the six New England states. So I've listed those institutions here on the table to the right. This past academic year was our first academic year, um, our first full academic year of implementation, and there's been a lot of lessons learned, and I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share some of those with you today and have some time at the end for discussion. But before I, I do that, how many of you are familiar with Khan Academy? If I could just see maybe a quick show of hands. Okay, great. So then that means I can flip the, skip this slide, I'm, I'm hoping. Um, but so, so very quickly, Khan Academy is a pretty versatile resource. For those who are less familiar, Khan Academy has um, the most robust material in terms of their math content. And that content is split into two different types. So they have videos. So for example, I could watch a video. Um, maybe it's a seven-minute video or a 10-minute video. They're relatively short on how to add and subtract negative numbers. Another way that they have academic content is through exercises. So I can then practice how to add and subtract negative numbers. And I would say something that's really interesting about Khan Academy is that they also have um, analytics behind their website. So as a student, if I were to create an account, um, everything that I do on Khan Academy, whether I'm watching a video or practicing an exercise, is then tracked. Um, so this is a snapshot of my activity on Khan Academy. Each color represents a different topic area. So for example, adding and subtracting negative numbers, converting decimals to fractions, that sort of thing. Um, and as a student user, if I wanted to say add Tamara or Suzanne as my coach, they could then have access to that activity feed, if you will. And in addition to that, they could also make recommendations. So for example, oh great, you know how to add and subtract negative numbers. Let's move on to polynomials. Um, and then they could then recommend, so multiplying polynomials, for example, to me, as sort of the next topic that I could partake in um, on Khan Academy. And one of the really neat things, I think, about Khan Academy and sort of all of these different levels of resources for students and for teachers is that it lends itself, I would say, to a very diverse set of implementation models in the classroom. And so I'm going to go over two brief examples of what we've seen within um, the institutions that we're working with on that spectrum. The first spectrum, I would say, is sort of very minimal usage of Khan Academy. So, for example, let's say I'm, I'm only assigning videos to my students to watch as homework. But during class time, um, I'm still going through my traditional lecture, and I'm still assigning problems from a textbook for homework. I'd say at the opposite end of that spectrum is when Khan Academy is used sort of in full force, where I'm taking those coach recommendations, and those are, that, as a faculty member, is how I'm assigning homework, is through coach recommendations on the Khan Academy platform, and I'm no longer using a textbook with my students. And I'm, I'm going to share with you two examples within the network. We've seen, um, I would say, models across the spectrum. I'm, I'm happy to talk about that if that's of interest. Um, but just as some tangible examples, so here's usage case A. So this is one institution within our network. They had already shifted their entire developmental math curriculum to a modularized, self-paced format. So students were moving through um, a series of 12 modules. They, they took an assessment to determine which module they should start at. So some students may only need to do three modules to pass out which we thought was a really interesting model. Um, and this particular institution was using my math test as sort of the, the basic instructional resource behind those modules. In addition to that, they developed an instructional packet or workbook that contained worksheets and various problems and things. Um, and through this project, what they decided to do was to integrate 25 Khan Academy videos on top of the My Math Lab 
videos. And so they gave students the option in their workbook to either watch a video or do a brain teaser or mind stretcher type problem at the end of the module. I think some really interesting points about this specific example is um, that the first thing is that students went beyond the 25 videos that were assigned. And in some cases, students watched you know, other videos than what was assigned. And, and in still other instances, we saw evidence that students were exploring the exercises and, and doing the exercises on top of the My Math Lab exercises, which I would imagine I, I haven't taught. Um, but I, w- I would imagine that's what we want, right, is for students to go above and beyond what's being assigned. Um, and, and I included this student quote here that we received from one of the student feedback surveys that this particular institution submitted to us because I I think it helps to illustrate one of the really great things about Khan Academy is that it's free and that it's accessible. Um, We heard from students that the videos were really great because if they were stuck on a homework problem um, and they didn't remember what the next step was, that then they could watch this video or they could use the video to review for a test or if they missed the class um, or if they had a question in class and didn't want the, to hold the rest of the class back, they could watch this video. Um, so just wanted to share that as sort of this preliminary example on the very far end of that spectrum of sort of minimal Khan Academy usage. So on the opposite end of that spectrum is what I'm calling usage case B, which is another institution within this network that's working with us So this particular institution um, was working in an environment where they decided to pilot a free course that was targeted at returning adults. Um, And and this particular course was specifically recruited for students who were very underprepared for either developmental math or for college-level math and who had a very bad experience with math. Um, One student described it as math PTSD. Um, And and so so I think in in terms of thinking about math attitudes and sort of a student's comfort level in in being in a math class, I think this this particular faculty member was looking to work with those students. And so again, this was a free course. um, And what she decided to do was to only use Khan Academy. And so she assigned um, her homework assignments and sort of she paced her students through this course by using the coach recommendations ability that I had described earlier on the Khan Academy resource. I think she saw some really great results, um, particularly in terms of the value add in the change of pre- and post-accuplacer scores. That was really exciting for this particular institution. Um, But I I did include another student quote from this institution because I I think all of this is is still, you know, Khan Academy is, is a tool, and it's not perfect. And there are two ways that I thought this student quote particularly illustrated that. The first is is student learning styles, right? So not every student is going to be comfortable using an online tool 100%. Some students prefer having a faculty member there. Some students prefer having a tangible textbook with an index and a glossary. Um, And and so I I thought that this, the first part of this quote was was a really helpful illustration of that. And and the second part um, is that, you know, I I think of it as being akin to typos in a textbook. Khan Academy is not perfect and no tool is going to be perfect. Um, I think with Khan Academy, because it's a new tool specifically and and it's online and you know there are going to be other glitches there that might not that you might not find in a textbook so for example it was difficult to type in some of the answers with the different symbols one specific example that we heard of that was let's say the answer was two squared Um, when you type that in it means that you need two carat two in terms of you know typing in the answer in the answer box Um, and if a student forgot the carat then the answer all of a sudden became 22 which is not two squared Um, so that's just an example of sort of um, what that particular student is referring to on that. So now I'm just going to summarize year one here pretty quickly. Um, so as mentioned, you know, this was our first full year of, acum- of, of implementation. Um, and throughout this academic year, there have been a number of changes to the Khan Academy website. It's quite different now than it was when we first began in the fall. And I think that you know, some of that is illustrated in sort of the decline in the number of institutions that are participating with us between the spring and the fall. A few notes about that. Um, the five institutions in the spring, not all five of them were participating in the fall, so we are seeing some institutions sort of drop out, uh, new institutions come in. I'll also say that um, I know that some institutions are missing from the spring because we are still trying to get that student level data submitted to us. Um, so there, there are a couple that are not counted, so I anticipate that number being closer to eight. Um, but, you know, across all of the sites and all the student surveys that we've seen, a majority of students either agreed or strongly agreed with statements like, 
Khan Academy made me enjoy this math class more than other math classes I've taken, or Khan Academy made me feel more confident in math, or I'm going to be recommending Khan Academy to my friends, or I'm going to be using it in future math courses. And I think that's just a really nice sort of feedback that we've gotten to sort of supplement some of the quantitative data. Um, obviously, you know, some courses have had much stronger, um, much positive student experiences than others, and I would say very similarly some courses had much stronger statistically significant correlations in student success, um, whether that's passing their fall course or passing their subsequent math course in the spring. All of that is to say, you know, well, what are some of the lessons that we've learned? I think there's, there's been quite a couple, and I think they've been echoed today, as well as echoed last night. I don't know if any of you saw the Gumbo Ignite session, but I, I really liked that, um, partly because I like to cook, but also because, you know, I, I think that that comment there of, of providing professional development and providing some sort of structure is really important, both to students and to faculty members. So s- specifically, I would say um, one of the reasons for that is for professional development is that with something like an open educational resource that's constantly changing, I think it's important for faculty members to be able to talk to each other and also for someone, and we've been lucky that Khan Academy has been really supportive of our project, um, to help to communicate what some of the changes are and what the implications might be so that way they can plan appropriately and map appropriately for their classroom. Something else I would say um, is that individual learning styles and teaching styles matter. So an online resource isn't going to be appropriate for every student, just like it's not going to be appropriate for every teacher um, and and what they're hoping to gain out of their classroom. And in in addition to that, I would say that it's it's important to, to help faculty feel as though they can align materials to what they're hoping to accomplish in the classroom and that they have the time to do that. I think what we saw was that the institutions and courses that had statistically significant correlations between student success, um, between student outcomes and grades or placement scores and Khan Academy usage was really related back to how much time did that faculty member spend and how much thought did they put into you know, making sure that they understood the changes to the website and that they could communicate that to students and guide them appropriately in using the website. All of that said, I, I still think there are a lot of opportunities ahead. So the first, some of you may have heard that WestEd was awarded a grant um, to conduct a quasi-experimental research with Khan Academy and the usage of um, Khan Academy in community colleges. So I think that's something for those of you who are really into research, that would be something to keep an eye out for. Um, in addition, I think that continued improvement of open educational resources, Khan Academy is consistently improving. And what we've heard from institutions who were thinking about you know, the fall implementation didn't really work that well, and this summer they saw the changes and they thought, wow, this is a lot better than it was in the fall. So, you know, yeah, sure, we'll participate in this coming academic year, and I think that's something to keep in mind is not to write off open educational resources or MOOCs just because, you know, the first couple years have been a little bit rocky. And the the third thing that I'd say in terms of opportunities that we see ahead is as a network, we're obliged, I think, or obligated, um, excuse me, obligated, to provide professional development um, for the faculty members in our network. And we have been working with an implementation coach throughout this whole time that we hired as part of this project to help provide training, both in person and virtually, to faculty who are participating with us in that network. If that's something that's going to be of interest to you, definitely please reach out. I know that he's talked to folks in Arizona and in California and in Washington. Um, So please feel free to reach out to us if that's of interest. And we've also developed um, curricular alignment maps between Khan Academy materials and, say, acupuncture topics or community college developmental math outcomes, and all of those are posted on our website. So if that's something that of interest, I'm happy to email that to you, but it's, it, again, it's also available on our website. So with that, I'm going to close, and I'm, I'm hoping that there's still time for conversation here. <laughs>